Well, good morning, Gillsburg. It is good to see everyone this morning. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know you are a very special guest, and you are always welcome in Gillsburg Baptist Church. And if we can answer any questions for you, please grab one of us at the end of the service. I have a few announcements for you this morning before I turn it over to Brother Doug. First of all, Brother Doug needs some help. So if you can sing or if you can play an instrument, or maybe you don't think you can sing, but maybe you could sing with someone else, find someone else and help Brother Doug uh, sing. So remember to help him. Also, the nominating committee is working. Uh, they have been behind the eight ball uh, due to the coronavirus and trying to get positions filled for the next church year. There's a few things that are kind of pressing uh, that I wanted to mention this morning. Number one, any volunteers to be on the nominating committee next year, please see Mr. Ronnie, Mr. Wayne, or Ms. Carla. Anyone who is willing to teach the new beginning Sunday school class, that is the college kids like Madeline and Dalton Reed and Bailey, anyone willing to teach them uh, at your own risk, uh, please see Mr. Ronnie, Carla, and Mr. Wayne. And then last but not least, it's kind of pressing, Bible Fun Factory. Bible Fun Factory uh, takes place on Sunday nights at 6 o'clock. It covers the K-4 through 6, and they only do it from January to April. So if I could get a few people to help with Bible Fun Factory, you could just rotate it or do once a month. But Sunday nights, 6 o'clock, K4 through 6, January through April. So if anyone uh, would like to volunteer to be on the nominating committee, volunteer for the new beginning Sunday school class, or to help out with the Bible Fun Factory, please see Mr. Ronnie Travis, Mr. Wayne Smith, and Ms. Carla Wascom. Uh, also want to remind you to be here tomorrow night, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Uh, Mason Moak will bring the music, and Dr. Gary Permanner will, be, uh, will bring our message. This will be a, well, what we're calling a youth-themed revival service. So for all you youth that's had off since March, we need you back here tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, because this, uh, this is for you. So please be here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And then next Monday night, next Monday night will be the Tribute Quartet in concert. So keep that on your calendar. One last thing that Mr. Tommy asked me to remind you of. The nail benders will be in St. Francisville uh, the 27th through the 31st. So you can work one day every day, just a few hours, but they will be in St. Francisville 27th through 31st. And uh, he told me to make sure I said there's entertainment nightly. So if you want to come help with them, there's entertainment nightly with the uh, nail benders. I believe that's all of our announcements this morning. So good to see everybody. Brother Doug, it's all yours. Well, good morning. Every Christmas season, we uh, sing a song and sing several songs, for that matter, and do music programs about sharing the good news that Jesus Christ is born. Today, we're going to sing about his love, and his, him and his father's love. It says they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news. We're supposed to share his love. Let's stand for the same faith. Share just want to praise you this morning for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. Lord, for the life he lived here on earth and for that life he gave for us, we might spend eternity with him and you. Father, we just ask now that you just enter this house of worship and be with us. 
send your Holy Spirit to dwell among us this morning, Lord. We just ask you to be with those that could not come today, whatever the reason might be, whether it be sickness, or sorrow, or grieving, or, or Lord, just plain not concerned. If you would, just reach down and touch their hearts and their lives. And help them see the need for you and to realize what this love of Jesus Christ and that most of all we can share with the lost world. Father, we ask a special blessing on this message today. Lord, we just ask you to be with Brother Vix who brings the message a little bit later. We ask to be with Miss Luana. She brings the children's message. May everything we say and do this morning be pleasing to you and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. hear me? Yeah, there we go. It's good to see you all again this morning. It looks better than when I first came in. I thought it was going to be scarce. Today we're going to talk about our hearts. We're all born with clean, pure, white hearts. That's how God made us to be born, was with pure, clean hearts. Now, before long, when we start getting a little older and life starts getting in the way and everything starts happening, we start putting a shell around ourselves, a guard up. People start hurting us. We start getting upset about things. We start getting mad about things. We start thinking somebody's saying something about it or not doing what we think. We even can get mad in the church. We can get mad about the least little thing. The place where you're supposed to be most protected and most loved, we can be hurt in the church. You can say something. You can do something. We can just do the least little thing, especially now during this time when people's feelings are on edge. We're all scared to death. We're all worried about what's going on. But before long, we start putting up a shell or protection around our lives and our hearts. Until before long, we've just closed everybody off and we have just this one big guard around our heart. I know when um, Tommy and I were trying to have a child, and it looked like we weren't going to have one. We started adoption proceedings. Every time there was a baby shower or somebody told me they were pregnant, I just didn't want to have anything else to do with them anymore. I just wanted them to go away because, you know, God was not answering our, my prayer. Thirteen years of a lot of you praying, a lot of us praying, God blessed us with Courtney. Things completely changed then. My, heart, my guard started getting down a little bit more, or a lot more. But Sometimes prayers are not answered how we think they should be, and we put this guard up. But what God wants us to do is to break that shell around us, to let us get back to that pure, clean heart that, so he can come into our lives and do with us what he wants to do with us. As long as we're like this, with a shell around us, we aren't good to people, we aren't good to God, we aren't good to ourselves. So let's remember that when we start getting our feelings hurt or thinking life's not going as it should go or we get upset about the least little thing. Let's remember that, that as long as we have this shell of protection around us that we think is guarding our heart, God can't come in and other people can't come in. We have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that th we can no longer protect ourselves. God has to be able to come in and, and do a work in our lives. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for the ability to be able to come to our, your house of worship today, Lord. I thank you for each and every one here, for what they've meant to me in my life, to what they've meant to my family's life. Lord, I just pray for each one of them that they will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that putting a guard up around their heart is not good for them and especially not good for their relationship with you, Lord. Help us to re-examine ourselves each and every day so that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we or coming to you with a clean heart that we've confessed our sins, that we've asked for forgiveness, and that we will do our very best the next day to do better than we've done before. I thank you for the ability to come here to worship with you, to praise your name, and most importantly, Lord, I thank you for your gift of salvation that is available to each and every one, to whomsoever calleth upon his name shall be saved. Thank you, Lord, in your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. 
John chapter 10, it says, The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus is our shepherd. He gave his life for us because of his love for us. Let's stand and sing. I gave my life for thee. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed. That thou might ransom me and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What has I given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What has I given for me? I suffered much for thee, more than thy tongue can tell. A bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. I born, I born it all for thee. What has thou born for me? I born, I born it all for thee. What has thou born for me? You may be seated, Miss Carolyn.
Thank you, Miss Carolyn. We can just say amen and go home, Brother Vic. In the scripture, Isaiah says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. It says, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget. It says, Yet I will not forget you. See, I've inscribed you on the palm of my hands. Your walls continually before me. I had a devotion this morning that talked about us, how we need to fellowship with each other. So as we're going through the situations that we're going through, especially now, that we need to be in a fellowship with fellow believers so we can be encouraged. And it says, I've included you, inscribed your name in the palms of my hands. That's a reference to our Savior and Lord because his love for us. When you feel forgotten, when you feel you're all alone, when you feel like just giving up, when you feel discouraged and everything's uncertain, when you feel you're just not good enough, when it's slipping through your hands And you've done all you can And there's still so much more to do It's easy to forget In times like this Jesus loves you Jesus loves you and he cares about everything you're going through. Your name is engraved in the palm of his hands. And that's a promise you can hold on to. It's easy to forget in times like this. Jesus loves you. The funeral is over. The casseroles are gone. And you're about as broken as you can be. When the sun ain't shining and the nights are just too long. And the weight of it all all drives you to your knees. I've been where you are when God just seemed so far. And I needed to be reminded to. It's easy to forget in times like this. Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, and he cares about everything you're going through. Your name is engraved in the palm of his hands, and that's the promise you can hold on to. It's easy to forget in times like this. Your name is engraved in the palm of his hands. And that's the promise you can hold on to. It's easy to forget in times like this. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you.
Amen. Thank you, Brother Doug. Uh, that was worth the drive to Gillsburg this morning. I'll tell you, you and Carolyn, to hear Jesus loves you and I worship you, Almighty God. Mm. Don't start. Mm. We've been looking over these last few weeks at um, the theme of worship. And um, there have been some things that we have looked at, and really we've not um, looked at a wealth of Scripture. We've looked at enough. But um, we talked about uh, first, in our first message, about meaningful worship. Wow, has there, has there ever been a time not in my life, uh, in which meaningful worship was more needed. How about yours? I think every one of us would have to say that these days, which are uh, not over, folks, we've, we've seen some things that have occurred that are not going to change, and uh, we've got to come to terms with that without belaboring that point. Um, some of these things are going to be with us for a while. And um, so as best we can, we've got to not lose sight of, of that which really makes a difference in, in our lives. And worship is one of those things. Um, in that first sermon, I said to you that we needed to realize the meaning of worship. We need to recognize the value of it. We need to organize the conditions of it and strategize for life because worship leads us to service and service leads us to the fact that we need worship for encouragement, for a reminder that Jesus loves us. Our names are engraved in the palm of his hand. Wow, what a thought. And um, we need to be reminded the, the, the meaningful nature of that which we, we say we do from, from week to week. You know, in the Bi uh, Bible belt here that, that we live Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. But I'm going to church. And, and we've seen sometimes that that can happen and it, like it did in the life of Isaiah. And all of a sudden, uh, we realized last week, like him, um, there were some elements from worship that may be missing. And, and Isaiah went to church and, and there had that experience. God visited him in a very unique and unusual way and, and, and produced a vision for him to see what was missing in his life as he entered into contemplation there as he saw God in the throne room, there in the temple, there was contemplation, confession, and conviction came to his heart. Cleansing came in that service, and from that, consecration came in his life. All of those things were the elements that Isaiah said. Some of these things, I ask you the very important question, what step are you on? Where are you? In your, in your walk, in, in worship of the true and the, the living God. And, and so to, to today I want us to, to come to a third thing, and we'll go back to our original passage of Scripture, John 4.24. We read a long passage there last time, but, but today I want to take just that one verse, John 4.24. And it says this, God is spirit. Now look at that carefully. I didn't misread it. God is spirit. And those who worship must worship him in spirit and Truth. If you read that entire passage, which we did early on, you remember that Jesus 
spoke these words as he was talking to a woman at the well who had come to him for a drink. There she had, she had come to get water and Jesus asked her for a drink. You remember that discourse? We, we read the entire passage there, but if not, you remember it. And, and, and the woman engaged our Lord in conversation and in so doing, she began to talk to him about worship. She said, you Jews, she was a Samaritan. And finally, after this discourse that they had, this brief conversation that they had, Jesus made this statement to her. And we miss sight of, of this fact. And so let me just tell you what the fact is in a statement. That passage of scripture, that statement is a rebuke. It is a rebuke of Jewish and Samaritan worship. I, I found that interesting when I, when I came to understand that. I didn't know that for a long, long time. That's a rebuke. God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's a rebuke. And so... I got to thinking about that interesting fact. I want you to see that the sense of that verse, because some of our translations are not totally correct. Now, here's what I was pointing out to you there a minute ago. Some of you are looking at the King James, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it says in there, God is a spirit. And that is not correct. There is no a there. If there was an A in that statement, it would mean that God is one of many spirits. He is not. He is the. He is spirit. He is not one among many. He is. That is his essential nature and being. He is invisible. He is infinite. We can't see him like I can see all of you and you can see me. Because he is Spirit, he is not confined like we are to a body. He is spirit. That's why the great hymn writer of the past wrote those wonderful, incredible words. Immortal, immortal, invisible God, only wise, in light, inaccessible. Oh, what a wonderful Wonderful passage of scripture that one is. He does not have a body. He is spirit. And so we worship him. That, that's not his total revelation because there are other things that are ascribed to God. But when we talk about him, that, that's not his total definition. But, but I, I want to say to you that in that rebuke, and you must see that passage for what it is. God is not interested in mine and your hypocritical worship. He is not interested in that which we would bring to him under some pretense and violate the essence of who he is. Not because we can't see him. He says to us, don't bring me religion without reality. And many do that. Don't bring to me worship without truth. And then there is that word in line three, must worship. You remember what I told you that the psychologist said? Men worship because they must. Men worship because they must. The, the anthropologists have yet to find a culture where men live that they did not worship something. Not always God, certainly not sometimes strange and, and, and ugly, but, but our spiritual worship is not an option. We must worship, Jesus said. We may establish the place, maybe here, maybe at Hillsburg Baptist Church. This is the place where the body of Christ called Gillsburg Baptist Church meets. But how many of us would like to limit God here? You ever done that? 
Most of us would have to admit he establishes how we worship. He sets the terms, not you and me. We must worship him if we intend to worship in spirit and in truth. Now you see, when he talks about spirit there, he's talking about the highest part that exists within you and me. It is that which God breathed into us. And that part which will live forever. It it is not fundamentally material to worship by objects or places, you see, as some religions teach. They can't worship without certain things being in place. You see what I'm talking about. But, but, But even if my body dies, and it will, even if your body dies, and it will, that spirit that God created will continue on somewhere. Somewhere. And the scripture says for the Christian religion will, will, be, will not be, it's not even on the table. It's not even up for discussion. You see, it's, it's what have we done with Jesus with that, with that spirit. If this body dies, I'm going to just increase my worship. And so are you if you know him because you're going to be in his presence. And it says for 10,000, thousand years we'll continue that. So that's why it's important for for us to try to come into some terms with what this scripture has to say to us. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And real relationship is a yielded approach to God. That's what that word truth in that passage is talking about. That the truth of God, harmony with God, in the will of God, fellowship with God, real worship has to begin with truth and build on truth. It, it's not emotion. Now, if, if religion creates within us an emotion, there's nothing wrong with that. That happens to all of us. Nothing at all wrong with that. But if we've got to get all worked up and and all fired up about something and think we have to do certain things and and, and get all emotional and everything to know that we have worship or we have religion, then something's wrong with that. And that's what some religions teach. That's just the truth. Authentic, meaningful worship, I've told you, is inward and it involves the heart. My soul can worship, oh man, I worshiped a few minutes ago. My soul rejoiced in that wonderful music that we just heard. But that's, that's me, you see, that's, that's my soul. But my true spirit worship is when through him and his word as he speaks and his spirit comes and we commune and fellowship and my heart is turned toward him and God then can get there and do what he needs to do. I told you before, throughout the Bible, we find invitations to worship. We find instructions to worship. We find indictments of the worship. It can be empty. It can be meaningless. It can be false. It can be a pretense or sham I said a minute ago. We find illustrations. We know the invaluable results of true worship. And it's important for us to know that. So in a, in a three or four minute di- dissection there, that's what that scripture is saying to us. God is spirit. And they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, here's the question that comes. Do you and I need to confess something like I have here this morning? Do we need to confess that sometimes we come here and go home and we didn't worship? We don't have that meaningful worship. We don't have that inward experience that that passage is teaching us that real meaningful worship is all about. If you say yes, and you don't answer me. <laughs> you got to answer God about that. If the answer is yes, let me ask you the question. And here's, here's the topic for my sermon today. What is it that's hindering you? What's hindering me? What's hindering you? What's, what stops us? What are some hindrances to worship? Let me share two or three things with you. I think we can draw from this passage. Some are in 
ourselves. Some of them are are in ourselves. Do you know that that lack of physical rest can hinder you from worship? All of us know a Baptist story about snoozing in church. (laughs) How many could we tell? I mean, everybody here has got nobody at Gillsburg does that. I'm, I'm looking. I don't, I don't ever see anybody snoozing in church. So, so you're safe with me. But, but those stories are, are legendary. Remember, the Apostle Paul even had one in his writing. He, he preached too long one time, and a guy went to sleep and fell out of the window. Remember that? He got hurt. I mean, everybody's got a... I, I remember one guy when I was growing up, and, and uh, man... That guy could sleep in church. He was the best I've ever seen at him. I mean, he had it down to a fine sign. He was kind of one of these sort of rigid fellows anyway. He was, I guess you'd call him kind of military-like, and his, his posture was really good, even as an older man. And, and when he sat, he sat that way, too. He sat upright. And, and I mean, he, he could sit upright and go sound asleep and did it in church. Now, see, I know all this because I was sitting in the choir. I had a direct, I had eye-to-eye contact with him. I knew everything was going on. I used to watch that guy. It was amazing to watch him. He could function like that. He, was, he sat erect, upright like this. He never bobbled or wavered, you know. He never snored or anything and woke himself up. He never jumped or, you know, nothing. He sat up and his eyes would close. And he would go to sleep sitting up erect. Everything was fine until one day the preacher called on him to pray and I'm telling you he was out he got that long elbow from his lovely wife who sat right behind him you know in his ribs like that and somehow or other without missing a beat he came up His eyes closed, and he stood up and started praying. I will never forget that as long as I live. And I don't know till this day how he did it. Because when I go really sound asleep like that, even the telephone won't wake you wake me up. My wife will tell you. But physical rest, the, the lack of it. Sometimes we have a hard week. And everything just caves in on us. And we don't get the rest. Maybe a Saturday night ball game. The lack of, of physical rest hinders our worship. But, you know, it can also happen because of the lack of, of mental preparation. We talked about this briefly in one of our other messages there. We, we forget God during the week. We stay out late on Friday night, maybe. We stay out late on Saturday night. We're running late on Sunday morning. Run, run, run. Rush to church. No preparation. And we think suddenly, somehow or other, this wonderful worship experience is just going to overwhelm us with this experience with God without any preparation on our part. Now, let me just get real practical for a minute. You ladies, most of you, go to grocery store and shop. How many of you make out a grocery list before you go? I'm not talking about milk and bread now. I'm talking about when you go buy for two, three weeks, whatever you do. How many of you go? I dare say none of you. I'd almost be willing to bet you that. Why? Because you find out if you don't do that, you get too much. You don't get what you really need. You, you leave something out. You forget something. So you make a list. And some of you, I know, have got it down to a really fine art. You even list that thing according to the way it's set up in the grocery store so you don't waste any more time in there. And you have to. And you go up and down the aisles and you just going from one thing to the other. You got it already listed out on your list. What would it be like? If we spent that much time in preparation getting ready for Sunday morning church. What if we listed our wants and our needs and our problems and our hurts and our heartaches and all of the other things. How much better would it be if we put that kind of careful thoughtfulness in coming to church like we do when we go to Walmart. Would it make any difference whatsoever? We've got to bring more than our bodies. We've got to bring our minds to church 
too. Jesus repeatedly says, you have eyes to see, you have ears to hear, you need to use them. We need to have thoughtful, careful preparations before he can bless us with every blessing that he wants to give. What about the lack of, lack of maturity toward God? The lack of maturity toward God. Sometimes our concept of, of God is, is limited. It, it's incomplete at best. You know, from the beginning, Satan it is a liar and, and a troublemaker and a slanderer and everything else. He has fed us so much junk. He has twisted some into, to the point that there, there are many people in our world today who are just mad at God. They, they hate God. Why did God let all this happen? You know, if you don't believe that, just, just look around. That scripture said God and God alone is worthy of our trust. He is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He, he isn't a tyrant. He isn't a bully. He sent Christ to love us and to show us himself. We couldn't see him apart from Christ. So he sent his only son and he died to reveal to us love, mercy, and grace. That which we thought about maybe in some respect but never could see apart from his revelation. Because he is a spirit, not one among many, but he is spirit, the spirit, the heavenly father. Divine love motivated him to do that. And Satan, because of our lack of mental preparation, sometimes it's a lack of, of sin confession like, like Isaiah. You know, we, we don't confess nor forsake our sin. Let me say this to you, and you listen carefully. Only a fool treats sin lightly. Only a fool treats sin like that. God hates sin, the scripture says, and he knows the destructive nature. And because of that, he cannot condone that in my life and yours. He knows unless we confess and forsake and he forgives, that destruction is going to come. That fellowship is going to be broken. Because he cannot stand the children whom he loves to go on in sin, to go on not forsaking sin, and to go on with that sense of guilt. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, there is someone here this morning say, that's it, he finally got to me in number D there. I have been confessing and forsaking my sin, and that's why my worship has been hindered. But what about the lack of expectancy? Remember what Jesus promised us? Matthew chapter 18, he said, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. With a heart full of faith, we come to worship. We even invoke him. We, we said, invocation, Brother Doug led it this morning and he prayed. We invoke his blessings. We invoke him. That means we invite him to come. We ask him to be here. He's already promised that he would. He said, where you gather, if it's just two or three, I'll be there with you. And yet, in our heart, we have to be honest. There's no real expectancy. God is spirit. And they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth with expectancy. Elsewise, no blessing. No blessing. But secondly, sometimes it's within ourselves. Sometimes it's because of others. Sometimes it's, it's in in others, sometimes those, those about us can, can distract us. People sometimes distract you in church. They, they do. Does somebody who talks in church distract you? Sure. Somebody whispering in church can distract you, can't it? 
someone m- moving around during this service. I remember one of my, my early pastors. <laughs> there used to be a little old boy there. I bless his sweetheart. He, he was he he was just bad. Now I just will tell you he he was bad. <laughs> but he sat on the second row right there, most of the time by his, himself because his mama was in the choir, and and he was sit on that second row. And as soon as he hit that bench on on Sunday morning, he starts moving. Now I don't know how to tell you what he did, but I'm gonna just tell you what he did. He went from one end right here. To the other. He was just like a machine. Back and forth. Back and forth. Up and down. He never stopped. The entire time. Well when his mama would come down out of the choir. During the, during the worship portion of the service. Guess who would be in the pulpit at that particular time. Well you would think you know. Oh she's going to stop him. Because when he makes one of his passes back down this way. She's going to grab him. He can't go any further. It never worked. Never worked. He could get away. She fussed. She threatened him. All kind of different stuff. He would just slide back and forth. One end to the other. If she caught him about halfway down, he would duck under the thing, pop up on the back row. He would just come down behind her back there where she couldn't get to him. It never stopped. It went on and on. I want to tell you, I learned a lot about being distracted and not being distracted in church from that child. I think that's why God put me there and put him there at the same time. I don't know. But you see, if, if, if we can be distracted in worship, we will. That's just the truth. You know, somebody chewing gum in church this morning, I just didn't hear a word that preacher said. What a cell phone when I'll check your cell phones right now. Turn them to silent now. Somebody's cell phone went off. I never heard another word after that. If we can be distracted, we will. Those things are not bad. That kid wasn't bad. He's just a kid. You know, it, it, it's not bad and stuff. But, but we can be distracted if we will. You know, we will be. And sometimes we, we need to recognize. Don't, don't let somebody else... Keep you from from worship. Sometimes we can be distracted, but we can also be discouraged or, or disappointed. Well, I'll just tell you, I know so and so about such and such, and I looked at them during church this morning, and I just didn't get a thing out of it from their own. You ever done that? Aren't we the greatest in the world about looking at somebody else? Oh, the big one is when we start comparing. Don't. Don't let him pull that trick because you really won't hear anything else I said. You know, sometimes we're habitual fault finders. So-and-so disappointed me. So-and-so discouraged me. We need to search our own hearts and stop that kind of criticism. We need to be like the psalmist who said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Or try me and see if there be any wicked way there. You see, you can look up here at me. You can always find something to fault. You can look at Brother Austin and find something to fault. You can look at Brother Doug and, and say, well, that's wrong. So you, you, I mean, you can just sit there and do that over and over again. But you know when you do that, you've just taken your eyes off of God. Not that looking at us is like looking at God. That's not the point. The point is, when you were thinking about this, like if I had focused on that kid going back and forth, back and forth. But I had other things I had to do, and so do you. We need to focus on my heart, be like the psalmist. You remember the story of the Pharisee and the publican? We remember it so well. That Pharisee went down there, and he looked up and proudly said, Oh, God, how lucky you are that you have a wonderful Pharisee like me to come to church today. The publican wouldn't even raise his eyes up, look down upon his breast. Wouldn't even look up, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the scripture says, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that publican went home with peace and joy and forgiveness and strength for living in his heart. Some are in ourselves. Some are in others. And some, some 
or, or in our world. How is that so? How, how is that so? Well, there, there are claims that, that come from, from false gods. There are claims that come. There, there are so many scenarios. Have you ever seen a, a, a family in which the wife was one of those individuals that, that rule the roost and the rooster? <laughs> You know, I mean, all of us know somebody like that. To the point that the wife had more influence than God. Now, wise, I'm not saying you ought not to have influence. That's not what I said. I'm just saying that sometimes we can, we can, we can put a person in the wrong position. Husbands, I know some husbands that just absolutely abdicate and negate their responsibility to be the man, be the head of the household. They, they don't do what they need to do. That the vows to one woman were meaningless to them. They chased after any woman or many women. Doesn't make any difference. You know? They, they become God. A husband can do it. A wife can do it. Children do it. Some, some people make slaves of themselves because of their children. And then expect God to say, oh, that's okay, I'll overlook that and go on. I anything can, can become God, even good things. A person can become God, but can be a pleasure. Have you ever, any of you ever remember a time when there were more pleasures that were afforded to us than the world affords today. Now I say well the last four months haven't been exactly descriptive of that have they brother Vic? No that's true you're right a lot of things have taken away but, but you know how many people do you see today that are willing to trade the pleasure of the moment for the peace of the future? It's ever true and it ever will be true. Life is dimensional. Change is inevitable and eternity is real. It can be in a person. It can be in a pleasure. It can be in a pursuit. We hear so much planning and so much emphasis on, on the future in the world. But, but oh, how many times do we focus our eyes totally on goals and God is never mentioned? Worship is never involved in those goals and those plans. We unreservedly give ourselves over to some kind of pursuit that are transient and totally devoid of what God's Word said. God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I have things that come across my desk. And I look at a lot of them, and they just keep on going. But this one caught my attention, and I couldn't get away from it. I couldn't get it off my mind. And I said, I didn't plan to put it in here today, but it just came at the appropriate time. You probably have already read it, but I'm going to share it with you again. I've been thinking about this for, for the better part of four months. I just couldn't articulate it. And somebody finally did. They said this. Several months ago, God may have looked at us just like he did Egypt at one point. And God had said something to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh wouldn't listen. And God said, Moses, go down there and tell him, and tell him again, and tell him again. And finally, God got tired of telling him. And he sent these plagues on Egypt, one after another. Nothing like they had ever seen before. Somebody said, God looked at us and said, you want to worship? You want to worship athletes? I'll shut down the stadiums. And he did. You want to worship musicians? I'll shut down the arenas and the civic centers. And he did. You want to worship actors? I shut down the theaters. And he did. You want to worship money? I shut down the stores and the malls and the economy and the stock market. And he did. You don't want to go to church and worship me? I'll make it where you can't even go to church. You 
you don't have to say amen. That's just the truth. The claims of false gods have a grip on the soul of America and this world today. The current spirit, oh, we could talk there for a while, but we've gotten so smart. We've looked at all of this stuff. We've discovered how a lot of things work, and we've discovered a, a lot of things that are going on. We're just thrilled and fascinated by science and by, by what it has to say in the people and the inventions and the discoveries. And you know what we're doing? We forgot about the creator. We left him out of the scheme of things. And we worship these folks, the, these scientists and inventors and whatever, all this stuff that's come into place for us. We, we look to them. We worship them. You ask a lot of folks today, particularly some of these that are on the street, tearing down America and tearing down the, the soul of this nation and all that many have died and fought and everything. For Let me ask you this. When is the last time that you got so mad about something you went out and burned down a building? I just want to know. Will somebody please tell me the answer to that? But you ask a lot of them. Oh, that's... The Bible is old. The Bible is old. Church is old. Worship is old. God is old. That's old stuff. And I'm telling you, he said, God is spirit and we worship him. We worship him in spirit and in truth. And that truth never changes. The pressure to succeed upon us is so great and upon our children that we've missed that long look. We've missed the here and the now. And, and I said to you last week, we better pack up and pray up and look up because we're going up. And it may not be long, no matter what we think we can neglect and we can refuse and we can do everything else, but we'll never get away from the truth of God. It is what it is, as the saying goes. And so today, I just leave you with one final question. What is the main thing? What is the thing that is hindering you from worshiping the true and the living God. What is it? And then, this invitation, I'm going to ask you to pray that God would send His Spirit to, to assist you as you seek to worship, invite him to be your teacher and your guide to get the results out of worship and the outgrowth of service that must come if we have a true, meaningful worship experience. The poet said it this way, Holy Ghost with light divine shine upon this heart of mine. Chase the shades of night away, turn my darkness into day. Holy Ghost with power divine, cleanse this guilty heart of mine. Long has sin without control held dominion o'er my soul. Holy Ghost with light divine, cheer this saddened heart of mine. Bid my many woes depart, heal my wounded, bleeding heart. Holy Ghost all divine. Dwell within this heart of mine. Cast down every idle throne. Reign supreme and reign alone. What is hindering you from worshiping God in spirit and in truth? Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, Father, how, how burdened we are in this day. The cares of this life and the pressures and the troubles and the problems and all the other things that are pressing in upon us. Have brought some of us to 
to the point that it seemed like there, there's almost no use to continue in some cases. And yet, you have promised us that where there is life, there is hope. We've been reminded in such graphic way this morning, Jesus loves us. We are written on the palm of your hand. Oh, Father, help us, help us to know that. Help us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love us, you care for us, and that you desire only the best for us. And as we struggle and fight with so many difficulties, loss of job, loss of income, the loom of this pandemic which hangs over us like a cloud, the increase in these viral cases where so many are sick and many are dying even today, Help us to look to you, the greatest spirit of all, one whose essence, whose being pervades everything, that he is the one who stood and spoke and all that we know of came into existence. Oh, Father, help us somehow to be strangely warmed even in this moment as your spirit strives with us. Help us to reject that which within us would hinder us from a true spirit of worship and fellowship of you, the true and the living God. I pray that this might begin here. Let it begin in me, Father. And I pray that it may spread even faster, even more gloriously than anything that's ever come greater than any virus that we could know. May it just literally overflow from our hearts to bless those around about us, make us a blessing to them. If there's one soul here today who knows you not in the pardon and forgiveness of sin, oh, Father, how we pray that somehow your spirit might have complete control of that heart for these moments that they might be strangely turned towards you and come to you in repentance and faith, calling upon your name, be saved right now. You've promised you'll do that. We claim that promise for them. And we pray just now as hearts reach out to you, that you might bless, you might save as only you can do. Maybe there's someone here today who needs to, to get something square with you. Maybe there's unconfessed sin. Maybe someone's had another God other than you that's crept in and, and grown and grown and Satan has lied and slandered and done everything else. Maybe someone would come and confess that this morning and, and increase that relationship with you. Get back into fellowship. Get back into step with you. Maybe someone would come on transfer of a letter in any other way that we receive members. I don't know what the decisions are, but you do. And this is your invitation, Father, so you be pleased by the desires that you have for our hearts and the decisions that we make in these few moments. And we'll give you praise throughout all of eternity and we'll do it in the matchless name of Christ. Stand quietly to your feet and as you do, we're going to sing. Brother Doug's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation all to thee. I give my all to thee, O Christ of Calvary, my all to thee. As you stand quietly, as we begin to sing, if you need to come, you just step on out and come right now. Don't wait another second. Come right on and let's get it square today. Come on. Would you come right now? Would you come to Christ? Come to Christ. Trust Him. Repentance and faith. Would you come and confess? Would you come this morning and say, I want to take Christ as my Savior, my Lord. I want to spend eternity with Him, praising and worshiping Him. Let it begin today. Let it start today. Would you come just now? Would you come? Come on. You need to come to this altar and pray. Come on. You need to come pray. Just come on right now. Just be in that knee for a few moments. Whatever God is leading you to do, would you come just now? Would you come on? All to thee, do you mean that? Sing that like a prayer. Sing that like a prayer. You can't say no to Jesus who said yes to the cross for you. Would you come on right now? Come on. Come on this morning, right now, wherever you are. Would you come? We're going to sing one more stanza. This is for you. This is for you. God says, my spirit will not strive for you always. If he's striving with you now, you need to come. You need to come. Would you come?
right. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you for your faithfulness to God's house in the middle of a hot, hot summer. My goodness, it's been hot, but uh, we're going to make it somehow or other. Uh, cooler weather is coming, and the rain showers are going to come and refresh us, and, and God will continue to bless. I want you to be here tomorrow night. Dr. Gary Permeter has not been with us before. He's a, a new face, and uh, he does a wonderful, wonderful job. He's not just for young people now. He is for our young people, but he's for everybody. I think you'll enjoy him. Mason's been with us before. He's going to play his guitar, and I'm sure he's going to sing. So uh, we'll do that. And then next week, Tribute Quartet will be here. You'll not want to miss them. You remember how great they were, and uh, you'll enjoy them again. They have a new member, and he is a great singer. They have a wonderful, wonderful sound, and you'll enjoy them. So uh, come and continue to do. What are you supposed to do now? There are three things. Wear your mask, wash your hands, say your prayers, right? Continue to do that. That's about all we can do under the circumstances here. We're doing everything we can internally here, and uh, a lot of folks are working hard, and we're watching and taking care of everything. So uh, you just continue to pray that God will continue to bless us. Let's go away rejoicing. Father, thank you for the goodness of this day. Thank you for these who've come to share and for this time of worship that we've had in your house. Thank you for blessing us with every, every manifold blessing with all that you've done, even in these moments this morning that we've enjoyed since we got up for safety and for security, for peace, uh, for a reasonable measure of health and strength that allows us just to get up and, and to get in our car and to go somewhere and to do something without fear and for the privilege to assemble here this morning. We thank you. Continue to keep us safe, Father. Continue to bless us, bless our efforts as we do everything that we possibly can to stem off uh, the, the spread of this virus. I pray that you'll keep us safe from that, keep all of our people safe. Continue to bless us. And as we meet back tomorrow night, as these come to share in word and, and, and this music, I pray that we'll have a great service. And then as the quartet comes next week to sing that we'll have another great service as we close out this month of Monday night meetings. But I pray as we look forward to the future that you give to us extraordinary wisdom and understanding and that you'll give to us that which we need to make good decisions and wise choices as they affect the future of our church over these coming months. Bless those who suffer today. Bless those who are ill. There are many who are on our hearts, and you know them, Father, much better than we. You know their problems. You know exactly what they need. So in our heart of hearts, we pray just now that you would bless those of our friends who are hospitalized. Some are in ICU and, and other things. There are many who we know, and we just pray that your peace might be visited with them even in these moments today. Now may the grace of God, bright like the light when the morning dawneth, and soft as the dew when the eventide falleth, be and abide with all of you both today and tomorrow and forevermore. For Jesus' sake we pray, and all his people say together in agreement, amen and amen. Thank you. God bless you.